طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Uh, we'll talk about sepsis management uh, uh, and specifically septic shock management in this talk. It's my contact again. So uh, we'll start with a case, a 78 years old male uh, who presented to the emergency department uh, with ultramental status and cough. His so heart rate is 125 beats per minute. Blood pressure is 70 over 45 millimeter mercury. Uh, O2 set of 88% on four liters and a uh, temperature of 39%. So this patient is, is clearly having something bad going on and probably most likely is probably is having sepsis, severe sepsis or septic shock. So I'll go through the definitions. Uh, so SIRS, uh, which I'm sure everyone have heard about is the system, systemic inflammatory response syndrome is a temperature above 38.3 or less than 36, uh, heart rate of mo uh, um, 90 uh, uh, beats per minute, white count of more than 12,000 cells per uh, uh, millimeter uh, cubed and or less than 4,000 cells, and respiratory rate more than 20 breaths per minute or a PACO2 less than 32 millimeter mercury. If you have two out of four uh, of these uh, uh, signs, then the patient has uh, a positive SIRS criteria. Sepsis is a positive SIRS plus a source of infection. Severe sepsis is sepsis with evidence of organ dysfunction. And septic shock is severe sepsis with persistent hypotension after adequate fluid challenge. Multi-organ uh, multi uh, syndrome is multiple organ dysfunction uh, plus in the settings of sepsis. So multi-organ dysfunction syndrome is multi-organ dysfunction in the setting of sepsis. So sepsis clinical examination uh, mainly focuses on finding a source of infection. Uh, so if the patient has any lines or drains or incisions, you should probably check that. Um, if you know how to perform lung ultrasound or echocardiogram, uh, bedside, I'm talking about point of care ultrasound. I'm not talking about the official ultrasound. You probably can check for uh, check volume the status and, and uh, the, uh, how the cardiac function looks like, if there's any signs of vegetation, pulmonary edema on lung ultrasound or consolidation. Uh, probably more importantly to check the abdomen, see if there's any distension or tenderness. Uh, if the patient has uh, uh, right upper quadrant abdominal tenderness, you have to think about uh, gallbladder pathology. If they have uh, signs of peritoneal signs, you should probably think about uh, uh, intra-abdominal infection, intra-abdominal sepsis regarding the cause. Also, you have to check skin. So you should have to check the soft tissue for uh, infection, such as uh, neck bash, necrotizing fasciitis, which can uh, be, uh, uh, the signs of that is uh, crepitation or hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic blood lie, septic arthritis, another one. And do not forget the back. Um, a lot of time uh, people forget to inspect the back, especially for elderly patient, because you could find a bad pressure ulcer, which can be the um, source of infection and that need to be debrided. So um, this, is, this is the sepsis clinical examination. The other clinical features for any shock, especially septic shock, uh, you can find the patient typically tachycardic the blood pressure can be normal or low. So the, the fact that if the patient has a normal blood pressure, but a, a, a very high uh, heart rate, that doesn't mean that the patient is not in severe sepsis or septic shock. Okay, While, wide pulse pressure, which is systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure, more than 40 millimeter mercury, also tells you that this patient has some distributive, uh, uh, some distributive pathology. Um, Shock index, which is another uh, uh, index is being used to diagnose uh, uh, different type of shocks uh, early on, um, which is heart rate, 
divided by systolic blood pressure, which performs better than only looking at the blood pressure uh, in diagnostic shock. So if you have, if, you're, if the patient's heart rate is very way higher than their systolic blood pressure, this patient is in shock. It's just being compensated right now and they will become decompensated at any point. Um, respiratory rate is another one, uh, and it's very important because it's a very sensitive, uh, very sensitive for shock in general. So if it's typically elevated to compensate for acidosis or hypox uh, hypoxia and hypoxemia. Temperature usually is normal, hyperthermia or hypothermia. For elderly patient population, uh, they cannot mount the expected hyperthermia. So it's very rare to find a very old uh, patient coming in with a temperature of 40 or 41 like uh, the uh, younger patient population. So a very minimal increase in temperature, that can be fever. And always try to get uh, a core temp temperature because it's much sensitive than regular temperature. So you should get probably rectal temperature or if the patient has Foley to get a Foley temperature. Hypothermia is also a big one in patient, uh, older patient populations. Um, a lot of time they, uh, they can be hypothermic rather than hyperthermic. Also, when you evaluate those patients, you should look for clinical uh, uh, features of end organ damage or in, end organ hypoperfusion. So cerebral hypoperfusion can manifest as disorientation, delirium, confusion, restlessness, general weakness, syncope or coma. GI hypoperfusion uh, can manifest as ileus, uh, which is common, uh, GI bleeds, pancreatitis, acalculus, cholecystitis, or mesenteric ischemia. Renal hypoperfusion uh, manifests as decreasing in GFR, oligouria, and anuria, or dark urine as well. Skin hypoperfusion, uh, which is very sensitive and happens early on in the uh, disease process, uh, such as cool hands and knee, pallor, dusky skin, mottling, cyanosis, or delayed capillary refill. So this is the mottling score. Uh, as you can see, uh, it shows different stages of hypoperfusion. Uh, this is levido reticularis. So if you have a patient that with a skin that looks like this, this patient is in shock, uh, and we should act fast uh, to try to uh, help the patient. Uh, laboratory testing, uh, uh, we can say it's general, gen general labs such as CBC, chemistry, um, uh, lactate is important. Uh, bedside glucose uh, monitoring is really, really important in septic patients, especially in elderly patient population, because they can get into, uh, especially if they have multi-organ dysfunction, they can become uh, hypoglycemic and they, sometimes they will need um, uh, even continuous glucose replacement. replacement. Uh, blood cultures, urine analysis, and CSF studies, type and cross match, troponin and cardiac enzymes, coagulation profile, um, TSH, T3, and T4, especially, and cortisol level, especially in patients that has refractory shock, because those are one of some of the mimickers of, uh, of shock, of, of septic shock. They can present as sepsis, severe sepsis or septic shock, and their treatment cannot be fixed with antibiotics. ABG or VBG depends on the clinical scenario. Pregnancy test to, for all patients with of childbearing age. Uh, this is really really important. Even if they're single, uh, you should send, you should test them for pregnancy test. This is this is um, this is really important. Um, ECG, uh, especially to look for QT prolongation, uh, also can diagnose some other causes of shock such as arrhythmia, STEMI, chest X-ray. Um, for pneumonia, pulmonary edema, pulmonary effusion. And CT imaging, uh, computer tomography de depends on the patient presentation. Uh, if you have any concern ab about abdominal sepsis, you should get a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. If the patient have chest pain or concern about PE, you should, you should do a CT angio to check for PE or, or, um, or dissection in some patient population as well. Um, echocardiography, uh, usually it's helpful, um, especially as an inpatient, the ICU of the patient deteriorated after uh, a period of stabilization. And bedside ultrasound is, is really important. If you know how to do it, it can add a lot, uh, a lot of information that can change your management. Our goal 
in managing those patients are two things. So the initial one is, is to resuscitate the patient as soon as possible and to source control uh, the infection. So you want to control the infection uh, and to resuscitate them adequately. So the surviving, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines uh, came up with the one hour, the hour one bundle to the initial resuscitation for sepsis and septic shock. So when you have a patient that uh, you diagnose with, with possible sepsis or septic shock, uh, those are the steps that you should do. And usually it happens simultaneously. You don't, none of these steps are before the other, uh, except maybe obtain blood culture before administering antibiotics. But that doesn't mean that you should delay the antibiotics just for this. So if the antibiotics is available, and for some reason you cannot get the blood culture because the patient has only one line and it's a difficult stick, administer the antibiotics, don't wait for the blood culture. So you should not delay antibiotics for blood culture, okay? So, uh, so measure the lactate level. If the lactate is high, you should measure the lactate uh, again, uh, uh, then uh, to monitor the response to, to your resuscitation. You should administer broad spectrum antibiotics, begin fluid resuscitation, and the recommendation is 30 cc per kilogram crystalloid for hypotension or for lactate above four millimeter mercury. Apply vasopressors if hypotensive during or after the fluid resuscitation to maintain a mean arterial pressure above 65. So as you can say, it's uh, as you can see here, it's during or after fluid resuscitation. If the patient is severely hypo uh, hypotensive and they look in shock and they have many um, many signs of uh, of uh, of tissue hyperperfusion you should probably think about starting uh, um, uh, pressors alongside with the fluid resuscitation you can you can um, uh, reduce the the pressors uh, if the patient is um, uh, has has good response to the fluid Usually, uh, the antibiotics of choice is broad spectrum antibiotics. And in our hospital, I've seen a lot of people uh, prescribe um, uh, peptazo and vancomycin, which is uh, uh, provide really good coverage. Uh, but especially during pandemic, we have you have to know your antibiotics. You need to know um, how you can provide broad spectrum antibiotics if you don't have peptazo, which can which can happen um, uh, if we have any issues with the supply chain. So. The reason why we use Vanco and Peptazo, Vanco mainly to cover MRSA and also some of the strep uh, and the strep pneumonia and the, some of the enterococci cocci and uh, MSSA. Okay, so it has gram positive coverage, but especially the MRSA. So that's the reason why we use vancomycin rather than ceftriaxone, for example. Okay, if we don't have vancomycin, lenizolid has uh, similar coverage but it's much more expensive. So we should, we always have to use vancomycin and you have to, you have to dose vancomycin appropriately. So vancomycin, if the patient comes in with septic shock or severe sepsis, the dose is not one gram. It, the dose is 25 to 30 milligram per kilogram. This is the initial bolus. And then you can manage, depends on the trough level. Um, the second uh, coverage, as, I ca as you can see here, is Peptazo, and mainly Peptazo covers the, as you can see, it has some composite co uh, coverage, but also the reason why we use Peptazo, because it, it has uh, coverage against gram-negative bacilli, which is, uh, uh, so gram-negative bacilli, and also has uh, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa coverage as well and anaerobes coverage. So you need to have anaerobes coverage, pseudomonas aeruginosa coverage, and gram-negative SLI coverage. But what it doesn't cover is ESBLs. So if you have a patient that's been in the hospital, antibiotics for a long time, and they, for sepsis or septic shock, and then got a, a period of improvement, and then they got worse, and they had, they got sepsis, septic again, you should think about ESBL. Okay, and the medication that covers ESBL is meropenem or ertapenem. Or not ertapenem, sorry, meropenem and, uh, 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 and the other, and emipenem as well can cover it. Cover it. So uh, meropenem has good coverage against ESBL, but again, it's a big gun. It has a very wide uh, coverage, so we have to be cautious when we use it. Okay, in case we don't have... Uh, 
peptazo, the thing, the medication that we should use is cefepime, okay, because it covers, has some gram-positive coverage, and it has a really good gram-negative bacilli coverage, and has pseudomonas coverage, plus, but it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have any robes coverage, plus uh, metronidazole. So if you give metronidazole and cefepime, you got a coverage that's comparable to the peptazo. The surviving sepsis kind of campaign COVID-19 guideline recommendation is to use a mechanically ventilated patient with COVID-19 and the respiratory failure. They suggest um, using empiric antimicrobial antibacterial agents. Um, this is based on, this is a weak recommendation based on low quality evidence and it's a suggestion, okay? Uh, but if you use empiric antimicrobial, if you decide to use empiric antimicrobial, you have to have a way for the de escalate uh, to assess for de escalation daily. You can use things like um, procalcitonin, um, clinical improvement, whatever, whatever uh, your metrics for de escalation uh, or blood culture results. But you have to evaluate. You have to ask during rounds: Is this time to? de-escalate the, the antibiotics. And this is, has to be assessed every day during rounds. The second um, management that we talk about is fluid resuscitation. So the idea behind using fluid and sepsis is mainly goes, it goes back to the frank Sterling curve. So uh, uh, in frank Sterling curve, as you can, as you can see uh, on the uh, X, on the X axis, you can see the central uh, venous pressure which is which is a surrogate for preload, and you have the cardiac output on the y-axis. And you can see on the curve, the idea if you improve the central venous pressure, if you improve the preload on a septic patient, if you improve the preload, you will improve the cardiac output. But this is only goes for a small part of the curve. If you reach here, if you get the pre, if you adequately volume resuscitated the patient, any increase in in fluid, it will only cause harm. And this is exactly what happened with cardiogenic shock. That's why we don't give patients fluid in cardiogenic shock or heart failure, because there is no meaningful changes in in um, in the cardiac output with with giving preload to those patients. So it's the same thing here with sepsis. So if you reach the flat part of the curve, you should not give any fluid anymore. The fluid choice, we have either normal saline, which is, uh, I think it's very commonly being used, or balanced crystalloids, such as lactate fingers, plasma light, uh, I want to caution you uh, on using sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is not normal. This is not normal saline. It's very abnormal. It has nine grams of salt, and this is equate to 36 uh, normal size of, of Lay's chips. So we're giving the patient the same so salt load in 36 bags of, uh, of uh, salt chips when we give them one liter of sodium chloride. This is very abnormal, and this is cause harm. So and this was proven by two very large uh, pragmatic, pragmatic uh, randomized control uh, trials. So um, the total of the patients that were enrolled in both trials are almost 30,000, 28,000 patients. Both studies showed that um, uh, an intake of one liter of uh, saline increased the risk of death or renal failure by 1%. We give a lot of fluid in the hospital. So if you think about it, um, if we have 100 patients uh, in the hospital, which we have way more than this number, we're causing acute kidney injury, renal failure, or death in one patient out of 100. And probably every single patient, maybe except the heart failure patient, they receive fluid when they come to the hospital or they're on maintenance fluid uh, in the hospital. The same thing, the same exact, um, um, uh, the 1% difference is also shown in the SMART trial, 
which pro looks like they have uh, a sicker patient population than the SALT EV trial. So let's say that you have giving your patient the 30 cc per kilogram fluid bolus and their vital sign did not get better. Do not give them another fluid. Do not give them another bolus unless you ask your question that yourself do these two questions. Is the patient adequately resuscitated? The second question, am I missing something else? Do I have the right diagnosis? So you have to ask these questions before prescribing, prescribing a medication because fluid is not harmless. Fluid is a medication, such as like antibiotics, like pressors, it's a medication. So you have to think um, before giving another dose of, of that medication. So the way that you can check for uh, if, if the patient is adequately resuscitated, which is not the case with our patient, is normalization of vital signs, uh, improvement of their lactic acid, CVP, CVP and SVO2 and SCVO2, and those are invasive uh, monitoring and it's not recommended anymore on routine use. You, have only, you use them only for very specific reasons. Um, capillary, capillary refill, this is, this is a really good physical sign and it's very sensitive and very accurate to, to show you that if the patient has uh, decompensation and their shock or improvement and their perfusion. So probably should do this on our patient while we're giving them uh, our resuscitation measures. And other important uh, one is urine output. So if the patient has normal urine output, then they're perfusing well. The other way to check if the patient is adequately uh, perfused, uh, adequately resuscitated uh, or not, is using some of the dynamic measures, such as uh, inferior vena cava. Uh, inferior vena cava is not a uh, is not a dynamic measure, uh, but inferior vena cava, right atrium size, dynamic changes in inferior vena cava or systematic hepatic vein, flow indices such as uh, tricuspid inflow, tissue dopplers. Uh, this needs another lecture, so I'm not gonna cover it, but what I'm going to, what I'm trying to say that there's ways that you can assess the fluid, uh, fluid responsiveness or, uh, uh, or volume status of the patient. It's very hard uh, and it has, all of them has uh, some uh, downsides and they're not all very accurate, but the CVP itself, if you have a patient that has a triple lumen catheter and connected to the CVP, they're not sensitive. It's like flip of a coin. The area under the curve uh, uh, of the uh, systematic uh, review showed only 5.52, which is similar to flip of a coin. It's as accurate as flipping a coin. What you could do is, uh, and probably it's not being used a lot, is passive leg raise. So if you have a patient that you think that they need, um, based on your physical exam, they need another bolus of fluid, uh, raise the legs and hold it in place uh, for a few minutes. Uh, there's a way to do it. Uh, I encourage you to look at it and look it up and uh, see how it's been done. But passive leg raise give the patient 300 ml bolus. So if the patient is on arterial, uh, on A-line and, can, and you can see changes in their cardiac output, if they have a Vigileo or any of these cardiac output measurement uh, uh, machines, or if you can see that there's improvement in the heart rate and blood pressure with uh, passive leg raise, then the, probably the patient will benefit from, or it will probably the patient will respond to a fluid bolus. But that doesn't mean the patient is, is appropriate to get a fluid bolus. For example, a patient who has ARDS, giving them more fluid will make them make their lung status worse. So they will be fluid responsive, but not fluid appropriate. Uh, and this is something also needs another lecture to talk about. But I, want, I wanted to show you guys that giving a bolus of fluid is not as simple as we think that giving a bolus and nothing will happen to the patient. If, it, if he used it, he used it, he used it. If he doesn't use it, it won't harm him. It does cause a lot of harm. So be careful with that. The surviving sepsis campaign uh, guideline regarding to fluid therapy, they recommend an adult with COVID-19 and shock, they suggest using dynamic measures, parameters such as skin temperature, dynamic parameters, skin temperature, capillary refill time, uh, serum lactate measurement over static parameters in order to assess 
fluid responsiveness. This is a weak recommendation, low quality evidence. For acute resuscitation of adults with COVID-19 and shock, they suggest using a conservative over liberal, liberal fluid uh, strategy. With a weak recommendation, very low quality of evidence. This, is me, this means that in COVID-19 patient, don't give them the 30 cc per kilogram. So give them, be, be conservative with the fluid boluses. And the reason is being that those patients, a lot of them has uh, lung injury and giving them such a huge bolus uh, can cause, can put them in pulmonary edema and worsen the respiratory status. For acute resuscitation, adults with COVID-19 and shock, they suggest using buffered and balanced crystalloid over unbalanced crystalloid, unbalanced crystalloid being the normal saline. This is moderate quality evidence. It's the evidence that we already talked about. What if the patient, you gave the patient adequate fluid uh, uh, therapy and they did not improve? They probably need pressor because the main issue with, with uh, distributive shock such as septic shock is a, 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 a decrease in their SVR, their cardiac output most of the time, most of the time is actually hyperdynamic. So they maxed out their stroke volume and heart rate and their cardiac output. They cannot get more cardiac output. Giving them, increasing their preload might can, can help with cardiac output, but if you reach the limit with the preload, then the only thing that should, can help them is increasing the SVR to improve the BAP. So the way to increase SVR is using vasoactive agents, such as uh, levofed, which is not epinephrine, or uh, vasopressin. Usually, we we uh, we need a triple lumen catheter for prolonged um, infusion of these medications, but it is not. It's not. It's very safe to use peripheral pressor. So, if you get called for an RRT. Or, uh, uh, or a code and the patient came back and they're hypotensive, use, do not be scared of vasoactive agent. Use norepinephrine, use epinephrine, phenylephrine, all of these three can, or dopamine, uh, but I'll talk about dopamine in, in a little bit. Uh, those agents can be given peripherally. I would be, I would be um, uh, a bit, uh, Careful with, with vasopressin because there's no way, if they caused extravasation, there's no way to neutralize uh, their activity in the tissue. But norepinephrine, epinephrine, phenylephrine, dopamine, it's been studied and they're safe to be used uh, via a large bore IV. So if you have a patient that has an anticubical um, or an arm uh, vein uh, and a catheter in, in the arm, not, in, not the small catheters in the hand, I would not use it on the hand. I would use it either in the arm or in the anticubital fossa. So if you have if you have an IV catheter there, it is safe to be used. Those are the medications that we can use. Um, the recommendation is to use norepinephrine. And when you reach a high dose of norepinephrine, which is around 15 microgram per minute, you can add vasopressin. This is the go-to medication. And the reason because Norepinephrine has a very strong alpha uh, activity, uh, but also has some beta two activity, which can help. Uh, sorry, beta one activity, which can help um, uh, when patients start to have uh, cardiac dysfunction from sepsis. Vaso vasopressin uh, is also increases the SVR uh, uh, by acting on the V one uh, receptors. Epinephrine, uh, if you don't have norepinephrine or it's not available at bedside, your option can be epinephrine, which is probably a better option than the, the, those two. Epinephrine has a very strong vasoconstriction, but also has very strong amyotropic effects. Uh, but you can use either epinephrine until you get norepinephrine or phenylephrine. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha-1 agonist, so it only increases the SVR and blood pressure. Dopamine, on the other hand, dopamine does not does not cause um, alpha one activity. Does not have alpha one activity until they reach a dose of ten to twenty microgram per kilogram per minute. Um, 
so dopamine on a low dose of dopamine, it only increases the cardiac output. It doesn't affect the, C, uh, the SVR. And this is in theory, but it was studied. Uh, uh, there was a large study, a large randomized control trial was published in New England Journal of Medicine, compared dopamine to epinephrine in the treatment of shock. And what they found that norepinephrine is superior. Not superior, but the, no, the, the, the effective, the, it doesn't change mortality, but what they found is that the adverse event is significantly higher in dopamine. So arrhythmias almost double the numbers of arrhythmia episodes with dopamine. Uh, all cause arrhythmias, every single one of them. So it doubles. So even VTAC, it's 2.4 with dopamine and one with norepinephrine. Uh, also, the uh, even skin ischemia. Skin ischemia is higher with with uh, almost also like forty percent higher in dopamine than norepinephrine. Um, so, I would be careful with using dopamine. If you have norepinephrine, norepinephrine is a superior choice, is a better choice than dopamine, and it is the recommendation. Um, to be used in, in, in sepsis, septic shock or every other kind of shock. So let's say that your patient reached a norepinephrine of 22 micrograms per minute and you started vasopressin and the left is not getting better. Again, you have to ask your, uh, your, yourself the same question. Is the patient adequately resuscitated? Am I missing something else? And most of the time when this happens, it is caused by, by something called um, sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy. As you can see, this is this is what a, an echocardiogram of a, a typical septic patient or septic shock patient. As you can see, the ventricle is very uh, very small. They're very active. It's hyperactive a ventricle versus this one, which you have a lower EF. The ventricle does not squeeze uh, like this patient. So in this case. Uh, this happened in 60% of uh, septic shock patients and severe sepsis patients. So in this case, um, you would need inotropy. Uh, inotropy and the recommendation is to use dopamine. Um, and it's only a, because it's a pure beta-1 um, uh, inotrope. Uh, but you have to be careful if the patient's hypotensive. They have, they have a vasodilatory uh, effect and can decrease the SVR. But if you use it with norepinephrine, that, that effect is not as, as strong. Um, so dopamine is, a, is, is an ionodilator and um, it can be, uh, uh, it can help patients with um, cardiomyopathy indu uh, by, uh, that is induced by sepsis or uh, RV failure or corpulmonal patient, which we'll, we talk, we'll talk about. The way that you titrate dopamine depends on many parameters. It can be through a swan gans catheter, which we are not using anymore because it doesn't cause, there's no mortality benefit with using it. Echocardiogram, uh, bedside echo, um, can be titrated to uh, some other lab tests like um, central venous gas or um, lactate, uh, but also can titrate it to, flu uh, to urine output and uh, and um, also uh, capillary refill. The cardiac output, if you have a swan gans, uh, or you can, if you can measure cardiac output, the cardiac index that we want is above 2.2 liters per kilogram per minute uh, square. This is a normal cardiac index. This is what you should titrate the dopamine to. So the guidelines. The surviving sepsis campaign guideline. So for adults with COVID-19 and shock, we suggest using norepinephrine as the first line vasoactive agent over other agents. If norepinephrine is not available, we suggest using either vasopressin or epinephrine as the first line vasoactive agent over the other vasoactive agents for adults with COVID-19 and shock. Um, they recommend against using dopamine if norepinephrine is available. So do not use dopamine if norepi is available. For adults with COVID-19 and shock, they suggest adding vasopressin as a second line agent over titrating norepinephrine dose. So when you get to the 15 microgram, 20 microgram, you should add vaso, vasopressin rather than going up only on the norepinephrine. 
for adult with COVID-19, they suggest titrating vasoactive agents to target a map of 60 to 65 millimeter mercury rather than higher map targets. So this is the target map that we should uh, stick to. And patient COVID-19 and shock with evidence of cardiac dysfunction and persistent hypoperfusion despite fluid resuscitation and norepinephrine, we suggest adding dibutamine over increasing norepinephrine dose. And these are the recommendations for hemodynamic um, management. Um, a lot of these patients uh, progressed to ARDS as our patient. Um, so our patient progressed to ARDS and got intubated. Immediately after intubation, he had a cardiac arrest. And this is the echo. As you can see, there's a huge RV and a huge right atrium. This not necessarily to be a PE. PE cannot be diagnosed with echo only. Like large RV and those patient population is most likely core pulmonal. So especially after, immediately after intubation, because when the patient become hypoxemic uh, and hypercapnic, what happened is the pulmonary artery pressure will shoot up and will cause dilation of the RV. The RV, and it will cause something similar to what a PE would do. And this is the, will put them on core pulmonal and RV failure. Those patients need INO, they would need um, uh, the butamine, they will probably, um, to, to, help them, to help them go through this. And usually after intubation, when you correct, and most importantly, to correct the hypoxemia and to correct um, the uh, hypercapnia. So if you correct the hypoxemia and hypercapnia and acidosis, you will improve you will improve the core pulmonal and the pulmonary hypertension. Acute RV dysfunction sepsis induced cardi can be from a sepsis induced cardiomyopathy, could be from acute pulmonary embolism, could be from ARDS. Uh, 20 to 50 percent uh, can cause this, can cause core pulmonal, and because of the acidosis, hypoxia, hypercapnia, and increased intrathoracic pressure. RC RCA MI and ventilator-related uh, causes. So OPD increase intrathoracic pressure. And the last thing is make sure that those patient, patients that present with shock, they're not always septic shock. You have to think that they're not cardiogenic, not hypovolemic, not obstructive, and not distributive, other causes of distributive. And these are causes of septic shock mimica, endocarditis, candidemia, aspergillus, uh, adrenal crisis, which is which is something that you have you have to always uh, keep it in the back of your head. Okay, thyroid storm, DKA, um, uh, acute mesenteric ischemia, cirrhosis, fulminant hepatic failure, pancreatitis, uh, toxicology, uh, salicylate uh, intoxication, beta blocker, uh, calcium channel blocker, carbon monoxide, metformin, and uh, HLH. Uh, which which COVID can cause a secondary HLH um, and um, uh, dress syndrome and pneumonitis. So those, you have to think about these. You have to keep those patients in the back of your, uh, of your, of your mind. They are not always simple um, uh, urosepsis or pneumonia, regular pneumonia or COVID pneumonia. So you have to always think about this. If you have any questions, please ask. Ask and thank you so much for listening.